Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we open the word of the Lord, shall we seek his guidance and his blessing so that we may understand that which is presented before us? Shall we pray? Good morning, Father. Help us today as we open your word that we may come to understand that which is being presented before us. Direct us, Father, for there is much we need to understand at this time. Our minds are not as open as they should be. Please open them. Please help to clear the cobwebs and the issues that we have faced. Direct us now. May your will be done. I thank you for each that has joined in this meeting today. Please direct us now and show us that, that you would have us to understand. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. <clears throat> Okay, now there were several things that we were addressing yesterday. We'd reached a point that you were going to share some things, Theodore, and we agreed we would come back to that this morning. Okay, well, yeah, and I did share parts of it, right? So, part of it, yes. Yeah. Um, well, I can just do that again. So, this had to do with um, Judges 1 16. Okay. Right. So we had we had seen there in the notes that they connected that to Deuteronomy 34, verse 3. Right. That is the city of palm trees. Right. And when we look at this at, at the scriptures there, um, and I looked it up here, I'll do it again. Yeah, there was a few different verses where this is mentioned. So that was Deuteronomy 3.43, Judges 1.16. Uh, they're going to mention again in Judges 3.13. And then it's also in 2 Chronicles 28.15. Um, and, and in that one... It says, and the men which were expressed by name rose up and took the captives and the spoil and the spoil closed all that were naked among them and arrayed them and shod them and gave them to eat and to drink and anointed them and carried all the feeble of them upon asses and brought them to Jericho, the city of palm trees, to their brethren. Then they returned to Samaria. So there's a bunch of symbolism here. <laughs> they a large amount of it, at which, right. which, um, and I think it was Angela who brought this verse out, wanted us to look at it, but, um, you know, we could see the Laodicean message uh, being addressed there. We can see Islam being addressed. We can see the seven times. Um, and even Samaria becomes, what is Samaria a symbol of? Well, we've addressed in the past that Samaria could be a symbol of the corporate church. Okay. Um, well, depending on context, I would think normally it refers to uh, to Protestantism. Okay. Right. <clears throat> um, being Northern Israel, but be, because in this context, this is not the Samaritans. Um, that are being talked about here. Uh, let me see in, I just got to look at this, I'm trying to figure out, because this is in Second Chronicles 29, we're going to have Hezekiah beginning his reign. So in 28, this is prior to the captivity of Northern Israel. All right. So this is prior to the siege and the destruction of Samaria. So here Samaria is referring to northern Israel. And um, 
So it's going to talk about the reign of Ahaz in chapter 28. So that, that's the context. Okay, so there's a note there. Okay. Sorry, I haven't finished typing everything yeah, okay. I was going to write. <laughs> yeah, I'm it's not sure. It's just some trivia. But... Okay, so some trivia. Nothing related to this. So, um, just so anyway, in chapter 28, we have the, the reign of Ahaz, and then there's going to be this... Um, He's going to be defeated by the king of Syria. Um, right. So, so this is, uh, and then you're going to have uh, for Pekah, the son of Remaliah, slew in Judah 120,000 in one day. So there's this war going on, as we know, that's talked about in um, Isaiah. But it doesn't describe this war in Isaiah, so it's in chapter 28 that this is mentioned. So, so there's quite a bit uh, <coughs> here in chapter 28 of Second Chronicles. Now, we know what's going to happen here, so when it... Um, here, I'm going to read this. Uh, so if I'll bring this up, so stop your share there, and I'll go... Uh, this here it says, uh, wherefore the Lord God delivered him into the hand of the king of Syria. And so this is talking about Ahaz. And they smote him and carried away a great multitude of their them captives and brought them to Damascus. And he was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel, who smote him with a great slaughter. So, um, and this is because he is worshiping idols, Balaam. And Zikri, the mighty man, mighty man of Ephraim, slew Maaseah, the king's son, and Azrakim, the governor of the house, and Elkanah, Elkanah, that was next to the king. And the children of Israel carried away captive of their brethren 200,000 women, sons, and daughters, and took also away much spoil from them, and brought the spoil to Samaria. But a prophet of the Lord was there, whose name was Oded. And he went out before the host that came to Samaria, and said unto them, Behold, because the Lord God of your fathers was wroth with Judah, he hath delivered them into your hand, and ye have slain them in a rage that reached up unto heaven. And now ye purpose to keep under the children of Judah and Jerusalem for bondmen and bondwomen unto you. But are there not with you? even with you, sins against the Lord your God. Now hear me, therefore, and deliver the captives again, which ye have taken captive of your brethren, for the fierce wrath of the Lord is upon you. And certain of the heads of the children of Ephraim, Azariah the son of Johanan, Berechiah the son of Mishalamoth, and Ze Jehezekiah the son of Shalom, and Amasa the son of Hal Hadlai, Lai, stood up against them that came from the war, and said unto them, Ye shall not bring in the captives hither, for whereas we have offended against the Lord already, ye intend to add more to our sins and to our trespass, for our trespass is great, and there is fierce wrath against Israel. So the armed men left the captives and the spoil before the princes and all the congregation, and the men which were expressed by name rose up and took the captives, and that's the verse we read, and with the spoil clothed all them that were naked among them, and arrayed them, and shod them, and gave them to eat and to drink, and anointed them, and carried all the feeble of them upon asses, and brought them to Jericho, the city of palm trees, to their brethren. Then they returned to Samaria. And it says, at that time did King Ahaz send unto the kings of Assyria to help him. So we know that Ahaz is going to appear, appeal to the kings of Assyria. Um, so this is in that context at the beginning of the prophetic mirror in that time period that this event occurs. And, and so what does it mean? Because we have, and, and we know that in the next chapter, 
Judah is going to make an appeal when, uh, because it's going to be the reign of Hezekiah, when they're going to invite them to uh, the Passover that's going to occur in the second month after they cleanse the sanctuary. So, so these stories are in some ways connected. It ties these all together. But what would it mean that, that Northern Israel is going to do this for the captives of Judah? I don't, I mean, I know we're just looking at it the first time and I've never really paid attention to this chapter before. Are they trying to gain influence? Well, well, they definitely are worried about God. I mean, about their transgressions. So they know that they've transgressed. They see what's happened to Judah and they know that Judah's lost due to the prophet speaking to them because of Judah's transgression. And so in order to, I guess, gain favor with God, if that's what you're trying to say, they're going to return these captives and the spoil. I'm wondering if they're trying to gain influence with Judah itself. And in a, a roundabout way, seek forgiveness of their own sins. Okay, so if you're going to take this, because Northern Israel would represent Protestantism. Okay. So are, are you going to try to connect this with, you know, the 1950s? I, I don't know if I could do that, but. No, I, <clears throat> I'm, I'm looking more like the 1980s than the 1950s. Okay. So what in the 1980s then? Well, when the membership chose to say that they no longer wanted the leadership to tell them what to believe and they went for their votes on the um, the tenants of the church <clears throat> were they not drawing closer to protestantism then i mean it was an effect of what happened in the 1950s yes mm. Yeah, I don't know. See, I don't know if I would do that just because of all this symbolism, especially when you deal with Islam, the, the 2520. Right. The symbols of basically the remedies for the Laodicean condition. Unless but, we argued that this is a counterfeit. Okay, but then then we're also when when I'm looking at this in Second Chronicles. And I'm looking at chapter 28, verse 15. I'm looking at this additively as coming up to a number 43. What, 28 and 15? Right. Well, see, I'm looking at, you got uh, 815. Right. That's a symbol of the midnight cry. And then it's two and two which is a symbol of restoration right two so that's the way i'm looking at that number well a chronicle is also could be considered like a table or a paper yeah but it it <clears throat> when you're looking at this and we go down to 2817 for again the edomites had come and smitten judah and carried away captives. So the involvement of the Edomites, the involvement of the children of Esau, along with Ishmael's children, has some real, how to say this, some real pregnant possibilities. Yeah, yeah so uh, the note there regarding the name Oded. So okay. Uh, this is, um, it means a reiteration. Actually, when it says in uh, Isaiah chapter 7, where this prophecy, this is in the same context, 
Okay. And it says, within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken in verse eight, that it be not a people. That word within is that word. Oh, yeah. Odd. Well, it's the word od or yod, however you want to pronounce it. Eod. I'm not sure exact pronunciation. But oded is just a, a version of that. So this word means a reiteration. Um, so, um, so this prophet who is giving this message, um, this to me is connected to that message that was given in Isaiah chapter 7. Okay. Because this is going to happen as a result of Ahaz rejecting that message. Because remember, it's right at the beginning of Ahaz's reign that he's given that message. So, so he's going to appeal to uh, Assyria um, at this time. So first there is this um, confederacy, right? So um, here in this context, uh, this is uh, chapter 28, uh, where is it? So they're going to be carried to Samaria and and there was something else I missed. Um, so, so Samaria has had anyway has this confederacy with uh, Syria, with Aram. Um, but in this case here, this is just going to be Samaria fighting against Judah, and they're going to be victorious in this. But then you have these people who listen to the prophet Oded. So, I mean, this is in the time of Isaiah. So Isaiah is around, but it's Oded who's going to give this message. And um, these people who are mentioned by name or expressed by name, um, are the ones that are going to be, uh, I mean, to me, they're doing what's right but they're not in Judah, they're in Israel, because they're heads of the children of Ephraim. Right. And um, so this is something I would have to look at as positive. So even though these are, are Protestants, they're obeying God, and they're noticing um, a message that is being rejected by Judah, by the church. So they're, they're accepting the truth. All right. That's the way that I would understand this in this context. So this portion of Judges opens up an entirely different path and understanding from what we've had in the past. Yeah, and, and it's tied to this message dealing with Islam. So we know that Protestantism has false prophecy, right? I mean, we know the Protestant methodology that is, is really not Protestant, right? So there is a true Protestant methodology of study that was then rejected because they adopted the Catholic methods. Right. There are still true Protestants that exist, right? They know that the Pope is the Antichrist. Many of them even keep the Sabbath. Lots of them understand a historical interpretation of prophecy, right? They haven't rejected the things that led to the Protestant Reformation. And so there is some connection here um, with something that the church has rejected. We can see that some Protestants have accepted. But, but exactly what this means, I mean, we have... You know, we have all of the symbols of our message right here, right? We have the third angel's message, the message mm -hmm. to the Laodicean church. We have Islam. We have Jericho, the city of palm trees. That's the seven times. Um, 
but some people are going to be supporting this message, but they return to Samaria, at least for the time. And then Ahaz is going to appeal to the king of Assyria to help him, which is, of course, going to be worse than if he hadn't. He should have just accepted the judgments of God. Okay. So, so that's so that's the one thing. So, dealing with the city of palm trees, um, right? Uh, we got just going back to this situation in Deuteronomy, uh, chapter thirty-four, verse three, where it mentions this city of palm trees. So, this is the first mention <coughs> of Jericho being called the city of palm trees. And we know that um, the, the um, yeah, so my one thing started again. There we go back here. <clears throat> Did I get cut off at all? No. Okay. So my one computer was fine. The other one restarted uh, Zoom. Not sure why. Anyway, um, so Moses went up from the plains of Moab unto the mountain of Nebo on the top of Pisgah <coughs> that is over against Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan and all Naphtali and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh and all the land of Judah unto the utmost sea and the south and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees. Right, so that's where we're going to have that first mentioned. Right? Okay, right. That's And, and so it's just the symbol there being in four, uh, 343, which is one of the divisions of the 777. And then in Judges 116, that's another division, the 161 of the 777 we have um, these Kenites, um, children of the Kenites, or so that's the Kenites, children of the Kenite. Moses' father-in-law went up out of the city of palm trees with the children of Judah unto the wilderness of Judah, which lieth in the south of Arad, and they went and dwelt among the people. So these are um, non-Jews, right? Uh, who are the children of the Kenite exactly? So we had some discussion, but I missed some of this because of my Well, I mean, the, the children of the Kenite have their relation with Hobab, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law. Yeah. So they are still interrelated because these are Midianites. Yeah. And, and the Midianites are descended from, I forget, who are they descended from? I hadn't looked it up. Uh, okay. I always forget all these different names of people. Well, they're connected with the Amalekites. It says here. But Midian was a son of Abraham through Keturah. Okay. So now what about, it, it says here, just this is uh, Hastings Dictionary. Um, but it says closely connected with the Amalekites. And I'm looking. I'm looking at Genesis twenty-five one to three. Okay. Yeah. So they're they're going to refer us to these, but uh, because because yeah, you're looking, looking at Midian, right? So right. Yeah. Because you, you've got to start with Midian in order to come to uh, understanding who Kenite is and what the interrelation should be. Yeah. Um, in 1 Samuel 15, verse 6, 
um, well, so first Samuel 15, Samuel also s- said unto Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people over Israel. Now, therefore, hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Telium, 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. And Saul said unto the Kenites, go, depart, get you down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. Um, For ye showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites, Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. So here we can see that the Kenites are living amongst the Amalekites, but he's going to, Saul's going to preserve them. Was he not led to preserve them? Because Saul didn't make a lot of great decisions on his own. Yeah, well, for what, whatever reason, it doesn't say specifically, but he chose not to, for whatever reason. Okay. So they're not counted among the kindred of the Israelites, it says here. Um, I mean, they would not have been counted among the children of the Israelites, but when we've looked at this in Genesis, we can see that Midian, their father, was recognized as being a son of Abraham. Yeah. Yeah. So he's one of eight sons of Abraham, right? Mm -hmm. Eight, have we not addressed that as being the number of Christ? Yeah. I mean, we know it's the number of infinity. So there's something, you know, something additional in this portion as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and Angela had noted yesterday also that it's in the curse of uh, Balaam that um, there was a reference to the Kenites, uh, I believe. Was okay. that? I, I mean, I know there is, um, let me just see here. Um, yeah, so Numbers 24 to 22. Um, so here's, here's what Balaam's final oracle. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam the son of Beor hath said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said, he has said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheth. And Edom shall be a possession, and Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies, and Israel shall do valiantly. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion, and shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. And when he looked on Amalek, he took up his parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations, but his latter end shall be that he perish forever. And he looked on the Kenites and took up his parable and said, Strong is thy dwelling place, and thou puttest thy nest in a rock. Nevertheless, the Kenite shall be wasted until Asher, shall carry thee away captive. So um, I'm not sure if I fully understand all that 
that Balaam is talking about here. But, I mean, we obviously see the prophecy regarding Christ. Um, and then he mentions Amalek and the Kenite, Kenites again. So they're, they're connected. The, the part where it says nest in a rock, well, when I think of that rock, I'm thinking of Tyrus, which is a, which, which is a symbol of the papacy. Okay. Okay. And, yeah. Okay, as, as I'm looking at this from a chronological genealogy out of the Bible. Yeah. Okay. Midian, of course, was the father of the Midianites. Yeah. There are three main branches of the Midianites. You have Zer from Numbers 2515. You have Reuel, R E U E L, from Exodus 218. And you have Job. It is from Reuel that Jethro or Hobab is descended. Yeah, and he, yeah. is, he is acclaimed as being the first of the Kenites. Okay. So that would mean that Jethro as the first of the Kenites then had his daughter Zipporah, which of course was Moses' wife. Yeah. Excellent. And the two sons of Moses and Zipporah would also technically have been Kenites as well, would they not? Um, well, no, because you go through the father, not through the daughter, okay. when it comes to genealogy. Though modern Judaism doesn't do that, but biblical Judaism does. So it doesn't now, matter who the mother is for your genealogy, it's who the father is. Okay, so Zipporah apparently had two brothers. One that was Heber, the Kenite, and then and that's in Judges four seventeen, and Hemath in First Chronicles two fifty five. Okay, yeah. So Heber the Kenite. Yeah. So. So trying to understand who they are in Judges chapter one. And I know we're going to run into it in chapter four, the Kenites. Um, but here in this context, when we're dealing with 116. Now, so, so we have this symbol 116. So we know it's the 16th day of the first month. But it also can represent the 161 days um, from january or, or july 17th uh 2020 to december 25th 2021 pardon me not 2020 2021 so um july 17th 2021 to december 25th 2021 in that in that structure um so it relates to the three 343 and it's the city of palm trees so the the reference here is Jericho and they come together at Jericho and then they're going to travel from there right because they went up out of the city of palm trees so that means they must have met them there it doesn't specifically say that and and in your notes there in the bible there's a paragraph marking so this isn't really connected to what said before this is a different thought right and, and then the next verse 17 is also a different thought. It has a paragraph marking as well. Right. So, um, so this is, is just mentioned here, not necessarily in this context, other than right. the timing of when this is. Um, so this kind of stands alone. So, so they're going to, the Kenites are are here accepting the message. 
and they're going to go, go up out of the city of palm trees with the children of Judah. And they're going to dwell among the people. So we would have to say that this is a good thing. This has to do with accepting the seven times. Okay. Right? Would it not? I couldn't disagree. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so so uh, just getting back to um, what I had shown that chart. Um, so these were the the various divisions. Oops. So what? You just hang on. I gotta do this again. Uh, my screen sharing's not working very well. It won't change that because my inter internet connection is unstable. We have several different symbols within Judges 116 that we're going to need to consider as we go forward within the study. Now, hopefully Theodore will be able to rejoin us here in a little bit, but there were a couple of things that I looked at in Judges 117 that I think are going to be important for our consideration. And like he pointed out, this again would have a paragraph marker. So I'll open that back up. So in Judges 117, and Judah went with Simeon, his brother, and they slew the Canaanites that inhabited Zephath and utterly destroyed it. And the name of the city was called Hormah. When we look at this, you would see this city that was inhabited by the Canaanites. The meaning of Zephath is watchtower. And there may be other meanings for it, I'm just looking at a very simple explanation to ask, you know, what are we seeing here? So if Judah and Simeon have now destroyed the watchtower and they have utterly destroyed it, then are they changing the name to Horma? And what I'm seeing there when I go to look is that Horma means devoted. So if they're if they're destroying the watchtower and then the, the place becomes devoted, what is it devoted to? And what were they destroying the watchtower for? Anyone have any ideas? Well, in looking at this, a watchtower would have to be something that they use to give a warning. And if they destroyed the watchtower, then the warning would have been ineffectual. But it still leaves open why they would change this to being an area that is devoted because it's not giving us an idea is devoted to what so there is a lot here for us to consider yeah which which name would have come first though zephath or or, or horma i guess it would be zephath that's the way it's being presented here. Yeah. I mean, from context, would you not agree? 
Yeah, I was just trying, trying to figure. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Well, they slew the people that would have been their foes who would have been in the watchtower surveilling them, right? So right. they would want to destroy it. Okay. Now, here again, we come down. And when we're looking at Numbers 21.3 and then Joshua 19.4. And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities, and he called the name of the place Hormah. And in Numbers, that would have meant that Moses would have called it Hormah. And we see in Joshua 19, verse 4, that Hormah is listed as one of the cities given to one of the tribes. So if we were to look at that briefly, it looks like that would have been one of the cities given to, to Simeon. Then we come down here, and Judah took Gaza with the coast thereof, and Ascalon with the coast thereof, and Ekron with the coast thereof. And the Lord was with Judah, and he drave out the inhabitants of the mountain, or according to the alternate reading, he possessed the mountain, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had chariots of iron. As we were discussing yesterday, this is a lack of faith because they did not believe God's word that he would drive out these nations. They took it upon themselves to drive out these nations. Now, how similar are we today to this with Judah? Are we choosing not to go forward because we're afraid of the Protestant interpretations? Are we choosing not to go forward because we're seeking to listen to those men of pleasing address that are telling us that everything is going to be fine, that are giving us a peace and safety message? Are we choosing not to go forward because the corporate church is saying that they alone have salvation? In a situation like this, we're having to look to determine what the iron chariots mean for us. Yes, they can be weapons of war, but is there another little bit more obscure definition? And they gave Hebron unto Caleb, as Moses said, and he expelled thence the three sons of Anak. And welcome back. Yeah, um, it's on my the iPhone, so. Okay. We were just trying to cover some things in your absence. Yeah. What did you cover exactly? Okay. I think you've been around Mark too long. <laughs> Catch me up. <laughs> yeah, see? Same thing. <laughs> okay, what we were talking about was Judges 117. 
And Judah went with Simeon, his brother, and they slew the Canaanites that inhabited Zephath and utterly destroyed it. And the name of the city was called Hormah. Now, Zephath, according to what I've got available, shows this as being a watchtower. Okay. And the name Hormath as being devoted. But we went through the fact that the first point that we were looking at for this name of devoted, it was given by Moses. Okay. So the question was asked, which came first, Zephath or Hormah? So the Canaanites described it more as Zephath. Moses had described it as Hormah. So by context, we have to ask, you know, which came first, which was most important? I mean, the meaning of a watchtower is this is supposed to give a warning. And obviously the warning didn't go very well because the city was destroyed. So how do we, how do we make sense of all this? How do we place this in our line? How do we look at this for our time and within this in the movement? Yeah. So, so we have the symbol of the watchtower. Right. Which um, is about this message of warning regarding Nashville. Okay. And the other meaning was? Devoted. Devoted. See, when we, when we take a look at this, we come down here, and in Numbers 21, verse 3, and the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them in their cities, and he called the name of the place Hormah. Yeah. So this is Moses that is calling it Hormah. So... Are we seeing Zephath having been rebuilt by the Canaanites so that we have this destruction going on twice, once in Numbers and once in, in Judges? I mean, from context, I would have to think that, that was the case. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. The context isn't always clear because they jump around. Well, the point from Numbers 21, if, if we were to read just the first three verses of Numbers 21, and when King Arad the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard tell that Israel came by the way of the spies. Then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, if thou wilt indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. And he called the name of the place Hormah. Now, nowhere here is... Zephath mentioned. Nowhere have they addressed a watchtower. Yeah. Now you say it, it means devoted or accursed. Remember that was um, the same word in connected connected with um, um, uh, what's his name? Um, no, the um, the guy with the Babylonian garment and the wedge of gold. What's his name? Aiken. Aiken, right? Right. Um, because that means de the thing was uh, devoted or accursed, right? So it refers to devoted, but also accursed. I don't understand the connection between those. Um, okay, now I'm, I'm looking back. 
I will I will correct myself because Numbers 21.3 is not the first mention of Horma. Numbers 14.45 is. Yeah, yeah. Because then the Amalekites came down and the Canaanites, which dwelt in that hill, and smote them and discomfited them even unto Horma. Yeah. So, yes, they're jumping around. Yes, there's some connection here with the Amalekites, with the Canaanites, and also with the Amorites. Because we find this again mentioned in Deuteronomy 144, hmm. which would be the symbol for the 144,000, right? Correct. So, they're calling this place devoted, which could mean a good thing or a bad thing. The way that we're approaching it right now, would it mean that it was a bad thing? That it was accursed? Yeah, and it's um, it's actually a different word, but it, they mean exactly the same thing. Um, well, they're related, actually, even though they look quite different. Okay. Um, oh, I see. It's just a different form of the word. Uh, because the one is two, seven... Six seven and one's two seven six four, and and the only difference is, uh, the city is in the feminine form. Okay, but they're the same word. So if the if the city is in the feminine form, then the city has some kind of a representation of a church. No, no, cities are females. Okay, usually, right? Because things are masculine or feminine. So, so cities are normally feminine. Um, but yeah, so, so it's Cherim instead of Herma, Horma. So, um, but anyway, the point is devoted can mean accursed. Okay. Right? As in, in Joshua 618, um, and ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed. Right, so that's uh, that's based on that same root word, devoted or accursed. Okay. And when we looked at that, that was something that was um, basically devoted or accursed it, because it was set aside. That is, God had devoted it to destruction. He had set it aside for destruction. So could this relate to Nashville? It could definitely have an interrelation with Nashville. Yeah. I mean, Mrs. White. And that also relates to the watchtower then. Okay. Because we have to give a warning to Nashville. Okay. Now, this is opening up an interesting point. So, Judah with Simeon, okay. two tribes together. Hey, just a question for Iran here. Iran, you're recording this, right? Yeah, okay, good, because I'm not. <clears throat> you mean an iPhone can't do it? Wow. Well, well I thought an iPhone could... did everything. I don't, I don't know. Maybe it can. I have no idea, but... <laughs> It's just that um, my recording stopped when everything shut down. My internet shut down for a while. I, I'm just teasing, okay? Yeah, you know, but I always take teasing seriously. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
So here, here we have these two, two tribes that come down to slay the Canaanites that inhabit the watchtower. Mm -hmm. And the watchtower is utterly destroyed. So the watchtower, it could that have been the church that was supposed to give a warning? That to me would be a logical application. I mean, it's a very difficult application to give, but it would be logical. Yeah. Okay, else uh, okay, so just one other thing, just dealing with this. So I was I put up this to share, and then they didn't share because my internet shut down. Now, so remember, I, I took these three different divisions of the 777 days. Right. And, and we could see that we have, in the first division, uh, July 18th, 2020 marked. And, and we tied that to 2 Kings chapter 25, verse 2, which talks about the siege that extends until the 11th year of Zedekiah. Right. And then we have uh, Jeremiah 52, verse 5, that no. repeats the identical verse. How many years has Ted Wilson been general conference president? I don't know. Anybody know? Well, how many terms did he run? How many what? Terms. Terms like like when was, you know, because they, they re-elect him. I think he was re-elected twice. Now. Twice. I think so. Like he was elected and then re-elected twice. And then extended another two years because of uh, COVID. I'm not sure, but I think he's been in since 2010. Really? I think you might be right. Maybe. Yeah. She's right. Oh. Okay. So 2010. That's a long time. That was, June, was 20, June 23rd, 2010. Oh, my. So, is he representing Zedekiah? Hmm. Well, I would think so. Why? Well, because of he's the last president. Okay. In some kind of context. Not not necessarily literally, but right. um, he's the president in president in this line, dealing with 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 our line. Um, so so we uh, so we were dealing with what the eleven years, the eleventh year of Zedekiah. That's why. You were trying to wonder when he became right uh, president. So, if in 2010 wasn't 2020 the 11th year, is that what you're trying to say? That's what I'm looking at. Yeah. Okay. So, so July 18th occurred in the 11th year of Zedekiah. 2020 would be the 10th year if you started. No. Oh, if you're included. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, now um, another interesting point, just dealing with this chart, is I added together the first group in each of these lines. So 252 days plus 434 plus 616. And the number that I come up with is 1309. Um, so I'll just do this here so people can see it. So if you take 252 plus 433 plus 616, 
you get this, or not 1309, 1302. And 1302 divided by seven is 186 weeks. So 186 weeks, 186 is the number of cardinal days from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. Um, so we have a representation there of the symbol for July 18th. And if I add up the other one, which is 525 plus 343 plus 116, or, or 161, pardon me, I get 1,029. Now that's divided by seven is 147 weeks, which is 49 times three. So that's seven times seven times three uh, weeks. Um, so seven times seven times three times seven. But anyway, uh, so these symbols here, when we look at this division and, and when you try to mix them up in other ways, they don't become as significant. That is, we don't get those significant numbers that you see here in this chart. I didn't try every iteration, but um, it seems that this is pointing to uh, the significance of this 777 structure is, is and, and these various divisions, they're, they're telling us something. Right. Um, I'm not particularly sure exactly what, except that this unit, this period of time from November 9th, 2019 to December 25th, 2021, has an importance in a very specific way, right? All of the events that, that occurred um, in, of significance in, in our prophecies for this movement occurred in this period of time. That is, we have the July 18th prediction, we have the siege of Washington, and then we had this final internal period of time in which this movement was supposed to get its act together. But we came to December 25th, 2021, now, I know that Jeff marked July 18th as the end of FFA, no matter what was going to happen. Um, but really, it, to a large degree, this movement, or FFA, really ended on December 25th, 2021. That's when all of these divisions that, that had begun, they progressed through this movement. <coughs> So we're in the time that we're in. So it isn't just that July 18th is a disappointment. All of this is a disappointment. July 18th was our Nashville prediction. This is connected to Trump. And then this here is just connected to this movement itself. And so when we got to December 25th, 2021, a change happened in this movement that I still don't think we fully understand. Well, and, and this is all typical of what's going to happen. Is this, <clears throat> would this be similar to the progression of disappointments that the Millerites faced through 1843 and 1844. Yeah, and all the way up into the 1850s, 1850, 1851. Unless you wanna just limit it to that period, to the Millerite movement itself and not to the Adventist movement. Well, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm looking at is movement to movement. Does this match up with the disappointment of the Millerite movement? Yes. And, and also, could we not say July 18th in some way? In some ways, these periods of time represent the first, second, and third angels' messages. Right. To this movement. 
And we also know the significance of 161 has a symbol for uh, the wave sheaf offering um, because of its connection to December 25th. We know it's representing this period of three days. Uh, we also know that uh, it's connected to the 161 to the league, right? And the 666 and the 1335. And July 18th is connected to the 1290. So specifically, you know, to get more specific, when we look at December 25th, uh, 2021, we still have another date that's future. And that date's quite a bit future. And it comes to us from the week of Christ. And I'm going to be doing a, a series on that on 2030 and the significance of the Great Reset and what this means. But when we look at the Great Reset, does it not have significance for this movement that, that there, our message, in a sense, has to be reset to give the same message that we gave before, but with the additional light that was given because of our disappointment? Well, I think you're raising a point that we're going to have to consider. We have very, you know, at this, at this moment, as you're working through this study, there is not yet a lot of meat for us to, to consider, but it's coming together. Yeah. So when we look at the Millerite movement, the Millerite movement, we know that we this that we're paralleling the Millerite movement, right? The basic premise of this movement is a repeat of history. Now, when we came to understand that we were repeating the first and second angels' messages leading up to the third, we could zoom in on the Sunday law in Ellen White's line and recognize that that our whole movement is about the Sunday law. But this movement has been led in a very particular way. That is, things unfolded just as they did in the Millerite history. That is, there was an increase of light. This movement is about an increase of light that is founded upon established truths. Truths that when understood, when seen in this new light, are actually more firmly grounded than they were prior to that. And we can see that, that that's true. We can look back at Millerite history now and understand it in a way that shows it was correct. But yet we missed very many points that, that the Millerites just, the, the Millerites didn't notice. And even Adventism after the disappointment didn't notice. The 22520s, the, the significance of the dates themselves in Millerite history, Snow's letters, the chronological structure of, of the Millerite history, even specifically understanding um, the connection between Millerite history and 457 BC. And even though Alan White talks about it, the connection between the three decrees and the three angels' messages. And also the understanding of Josiah Lich's prophecy in a much deeper way. Now, this movement has been an unfolding of this light. But would it be once the light is unfolded that then the movement has the message to give? Repeat that, please. So once that light is unfolded, once the, the seven... Uh, thunders are unsealed. Isn't it at that point that the movement then has the message? Yes. Okay. So we've been giving a message all the way through this, but that message has been an unfolding of light. But the movement has to come to the point where it now has the message and that message is going to be empowered. And, and it's not about just the message. It's about the people. So you have a message and 
a group of people that are connected with the unfolding of this message, that are connected with giving the message. Because if we look at this movement now, this movement is in no position to give a message of warning to Seventh-day Adventists or the world, correct? Very correct. Right. And yet we, we try to pretend we have a message and that we're giving it when we're not doing anything. I mean, right now we're studying, which is necessary. And, and sure, we're putting things on YouTube, but that's primarily for people in this movement. And that was true in um, 1850. They hadn't really begun a work outside of the movement. And see, this, this is why when we were talking about this, when I asked the question about the disappointment of 1843 to 1844, I'm looking at this more as that time period of disappointments being up through December 25th of 2021. Yeah. So... What you're, re what you're referring to here with this, with the continuing studies, is more in line with the Adventist portion from 1844 through, let's say, to 1850 at this point. Because by, yeah. 18, by 1850, the chart by Brother Nichols was being developed and prepared to go out. So there was a decided message that went with the 1850 chart that had gone hand in hand with the 1843 chart. Mm -hmm. So we're in, in a position right now where the message that is being developed is very much in line with Father Miller's dream where the jewels have been scattered, the jewels are about to be assembled back into the curiously wrought casket and will shine at greater glory because those jewels not, are not just the people, but are also the message that is to go out. Mm -hmm. But we cannot give a message that we do not fully understand. And that's the reason for the study. Right. And, and, and we know that, that it's not popular, let's put it that way, to uh, be looking at, at the things we are um, and taking the position that we do. Uh, with many and the reason the reason why it's not popular is is why why is it not popular why is what we're doing right now not popular with the movement truth never is it's not flattering to people yeah but i'm talking about in a more specific sense well she's got a good point yeah i know it's 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 definitely not flattering but it's, it's also, th this situation is a lot like having a wound, you cover the wound with a bandage, and then all of a sudden that bandage is being ripped away. It hurts. It hurts to recognize the issue that's underneath. And truth will do that. Yeah. So there's a lot. There's really a lot that, that in these portions that we've been studying, especially in Joshua and Judges. And in comparison with the minor prophets that we have not wanted to study before. No, and, and, and we can see how little we actually understand of the scriptures. Yes. Like we were almost in complete ignorance of the scriptures, to be honest. 
and we still are. It is agreed. You know, and, and this was the thing about the movement. I, I was a knowledgeable Adventist prior to coming into this movement. But once I joined this movement, I was as ignorant as possible to be. That is, almost everything I knew was so surface, even though there were certain points here and there that I could then understand once I understand, understood this message. I was only just looking at, at the very surface level of Adventism. But many people are still holding on to that understanding that they had, either prior to being an Adventist or, or prior to this movement when they were an Adventist, or even the ones that have come into this movement haven't understood the deep things of God. And, and But we still understand so little. And... We, but yet we have to give a message to the world. We have to represent Christ when we're completely unfit to do so. And, and we don't even have a message. And, and we sort of try to pull something back from what was done in the past and try to say, well, that's our message. We just got the same message. But we didn't even understand that message. So it, it seems to me that there's a lot that has to occur for this movement to, to accomplish what it's supposed to accomplish. Okay. Um, you know, so I, in, in the studies, the things that I found chronologically dealing with uh, 2030 and how it ties to this message. I don't think that we can ignore it. Once people look at it, and they look at, at what has happened. So many people, from my point of view, many people will reject the 2030 date because they, they won't, they'll just see it as time setting, which is not what it's about. It's about understanding our message presently and our experience. Because we don't know what 2030 means, other than that it's a date on a line that's connected to our present history. And, and so we can't predict any events. But what we can say is that God is giving this movement a period of time to accomplish the work that we did not accomplish. And I don't know how that's going to happen. Like, I don't know how, you know, in in 1850, how the Seventh-day Adventists, who were just a scattered flock, could then pick up this message and accomplish all that they accomplished, apart from the fact that God, in his providence, had put them in that situation. But if you were looking at it from somebody then, there would be no reason to believe that these few scattered people in in Maine and, you know. In New the, England, primarily. New England, right? Are, are going to accomplish and build up what exists today as Seventh-day Adventism. Right? There's no idea that that message would happen, that you would have all of these books in the spirit of prophecy and all of this light that was given. You couldn't have imagined it. Um, back then, if you just knew these Adventists, you would just think there's a few crazy people. Um, and yet much was accomplished by God's providence. And, and the same has to be true today. But the question is, are we going to learn from our past or are we just going to continue to repeat the same mistakes? Right. Well, two comments from the chat. <laughs> One, jewels cleaned and put back into the casket, internalizing the correct doctrines and the prophecies. That may or may not be correct. That may have a very good point, but we're going to have to think about that. Now, the second one, and this one, this one is interesting for me. The Babylonian square has six by six rows totaling 36 numbers 
adding up to 666. Yeah. Seven by seven rows, total 49 numbers add up to 1,225. December. December 25th. Jehoiachin could connect both of them being released 36 years into the 666 years that ends in 70 AD and on the 12th month of the 25th day symbolizing the seven by seven square. Yeah, so that's extremely important. Um, right, so we can see the seven times seven, that is, and, and that's symbolizing our 777 days. But it's also it, seven times by seven times. Yeah, seven times by seven times. Gives us that, that December 25th date in which Jehoiachin is released from prison. Right. 36 years into the 666 years. So, it, it, yeah, so, so these things are all connected. Well, here's another point. I mean, if this is 36 years into the 666 years, yeah, then you have a, a period of 36 years and you have a period of 630 years, right? Well, yes, but there's also 36 years at the end. So, yeah, it depends how you want to look at it. But 666 uh, minus 72, because there's 36 years at the beginning and, and the end, is right. 594. It's 5 what? 594. Okay. So, so there's... Um, Uh, and 594 divided by 6 is 99, which is uh, 666 or 66 upside down. Oh, okay. So there is a structure in there that's similar to, if you, if you want to look at it, I also look at it as a parallel with the 490 years or 70 weeks. Now, the 70 weeks has 49 years at the beginning, seven years at the end, with th uh, 434 years in the middle. Okay. Um, so these two things are related. Right. That is the, the 666 structure and the 666 years, the Babylonian square, is Satan's counterfeit of the 777. Okay. But God takes that into account. So he uses it prophetically. He uses Satan's numbers against him, if that makes sense, as symbols, right? Exactly. Yes. So, so I, I think, you know, there's a lot still to be understood. But um, we will see when I do my presentation on 2030, the Great Reset, um, we will see that Satan is paralleling or counterfeiting uh, the work of Christ. He always has been. And the work that's done at the end in the threefold union, in the Sunday law, are all counterfeits of Christ's kingdom. And we can all agree with that. Right. Right. Um, you know, the, two, the 2520 for Northern Israel, it's a counterfeit of Christ's covenant week. It's the satanic covenant week. The two 1260s with the cross in the middle, if you want to put it that way, the 30 years in the middle. And, and so Satan is trying to make up his kingdom. But that's in, and, and the only ones that really counter that are those that are on the earth, the 144,000, who are part of Christ making up his kingdom. And at the end, you have two different kingdoms that come together. Satan's kingdom is complete and ready for destruction. Yep. So, so it's, it's important for us to understand these things. 
and not look at this superficially. Like if we're just wait, looking for a Sunday law to happen in 2022 or 2023, I think we're short-sighted. Extremely. Like, I, I don't think, you know, it's, it's a peace and safety message to say we have a work to do and that if we don't do this work, we will be lost. And to me, it's a peace and safety message when we are looking for this work to be completed now, when we're not even interested in the work that has to be done. That to me is a peace and safety message. Well, okay, let's, let's take a parallel hill here. So I yep. know we, we have very lim limited time left. During the time of Christ's ministry upon earth, the disciples believed that he would be setting up a kingdom upon earth, right? Mm -hmm. Was that not the ultimate peace and safety message as far as they were concerned? Yeah. So now we have a situation that he's crucified and the kingdom is not going to be set up on earth and they're left in doubt and wondering about what was going on. Mm -hmm. Then afterward for 40 days, they had to have a very intense study of what was to occur. And at the end of 50 days, they began to understand what their message was truly going to be because they had come to a point where they admitted their sins to one another, they prayed with one another, and they came away from that upper room after 49 days, ready to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. We cannot do anything different because our situation is that we have not been ready to go forward to give a message. So. And we're not doing anything to, to give that message. Right. Like, and, and I don't think that we should right now be trying to give that message because we don't have the message to give. We have to study. And that's, that, that's become part of the point, because the more I'm looking at some of these other um, fringe ministries, and I know that there are some that, that would say that I'm very wrong, but I'm, I'm comparing in that Walter Bythe. All of this is not giving the message that we are to be giving, because it's no, it is really not the true third angel's message. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Okay. So we're now at the point of the close of our time together. Any other thoughts or questions? Any other comments? Well, I just have one question with that chart that's in front of me. Is there any other natural division of this 777? that we should consider? Well, let's think about that and return to this first thing on Sunday. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So shall, now, shall we close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you today for this time that we have spent together. We thank you for the comments the questions, and the contributions of all that have been here. We ask now, Father, for your direction. You know the message that is to go forward. We need to learn the message. We need our minds opened so that we can understand the message that we are to give. Help us to this end. Direct us through this day. Help us to consider all that we have, have discussed. And may your will be done in all that you would have us to do today. To this end, we thank you and we praise you.
in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.